Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. We are glad you are here with us in our online space. I have several announcements this morning before we get to worship, the first of which is about our Youth Minecraft server. I have got it back online, uh, worked with Microsoft to get that fixed, and I also heard that PlayStation users have access to Realms now. So if you wanted to join the Minecraft server before but couldn't, you should be able to connect now. Just shoot me an email or a message and we'll try to get you online. The second announcement I have is from our mission team. We are extremely grateful for everyone who showed up yesterday to come and pick up these no-sew blankets uh, to make them at home so we can deliver them and donate them to some of our veterans. The third is, if you missed the opportunity to make blankets and want to do more mission efforts in our church, Loaves and Fishes still needs help. We are looking for people who, to help deliver food to the shelter, once it's already made, on Mondays and Tuesdays. If you're delivering lunch, we send it out at 11 a.m., and dinner we send out at 4 p.m. We also, if you have time on the weekends, need help with our groceries. We have dedicated grocery team pickup leaders, but sometimes one car just isn't enough. So if you would like to come and be a car to help carry groceries from either Jewel Osco on Sunday or from Whole Foods on Saturday, let me know and we'll get you a time to help out. We always need people who are there to help make this ministry a huge success. And we always need people to help make food either in the church kitchen or at home. And if you want to be a part of any of this wonderful ministry mission that we have at our church, just reach out and let me know that you'd like to be involved. Our annual meeting is coming up. It is next Sunday, February 14th at 10 a.m. And it will be online. We'll be sending out a link soon so that you can keep an eye out in your email box for that. Uh, we're going to be trying an online annual meeting like most people in our church right now. So we look forward to seeing you all online, uh, making our church a better place. That is all the announcements that I have that I remember. So let us turn our hearts and minds to worship as we join together in our call to worship. God loves us and cares for us deeply. God calls us to live a life of faith, and we have answered through word and deed. Come, let us sing our praises to the God above. Come, let us worship the Lord. To today's children's sermon. We are talking about the fruit of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Today's fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Today's actual fruit are oranges. Whenever I look at an orange, 
I can't help but remember the first time that I thought oranges tasted good. When I was in middle school and high school, my older brother was a voracious orange eater, and I did not care for them. <laughs> and I would eat uh, usually apples or pears or something else. And it wasn't until when I was in college that I found an orange tasty. When you go to college, you usually have a lot of things to move into a very small room. And if you're lucky, your parents will help you move in. But not everyone has that. And so to help out, our college asked those of us who were on campus early for music or any other special purpose to help these students move into their rooms. And sometimes that meant carrying a mini refrigerator up three flights of stairs, realizing you went up the wrong flight of stairs, carrying it back down those three flights of stairs and up the next three flights in the next door tower. Our college president had to do that more than once. But what we did was we would wander around in the parking lots and we would help carry in the real heavy stuff, people who looked like they needed a hand. And we did it because we wanted to be nice. We wanted these people to realize that they were welcome and that there were kind people who were willing to help. And when we did this for a couple of hours, I was exhausted. I was exhausted and I was tired and my muscles hurt and they had orange slices. And I grabbed an orange slice and I bit into it and all I could think was, this is so juicy and it is so delicious right now i think i ate like seven orange slices back to back to back and i've liked oranges when i'm in the mood for them since then but they always make me think of the time when i took a little extra effort to be kind and so i want to encourage you to remember to be kind to other people, to do what you can to help out around your house by cleaning up, by doing dishes, by mowing the lawn when you're big enough to handle a lawnmower, and to be kind to yourself. So, I'm going to show you a little treat to give you a nice pick-me-up when you've been working really hard. The first thing is we're gonna want some yogurt. You could pick whatever your favorite yogurt is, but plain yogurt works really well for this. We are making a parfait, sort of. The next thing that you're gonna want is some granola. Now this is a leftover streusel topping from last week's pear recipe. We put it in the oven on a plain pan by itself for you know, five, ten minutes and toasted it up. And here we have granola. You can also look up recipes online. It's actually really easy and really fun to do. And so we're going to take some granola and we're just going to sprinkle it on top very generously. So we'll get a nice layer of granola on top of our yogurt here. And then grab your favorite honey. I like them, they come in the little bears. I think they're cute. This is a star thistle honey, very fancy. Uh, and just for that little extra kick of sweetness, we're gonna add a nice healthy dollop of honey. The reason why I'm adding sugar is that my yogurt doesn't come with sugar on its own. A lot of yogurts do. Parents, you should probably know this. Uh, the, a lot of yogurts come with a lot of sugar in them, so I'm adding honey because mine doesn't come with sugar. And then we're just going to add a few orange slices. And you can add as much or as little as you like. Remembering to be kind to others is important. Remembering to be kind to yourself is also important. So I hope that you remember this week and next week and, well, every week to take a little time to be kind, not just to your family, not just to your friends.
but also to yourself. Let's pray. Holy Almighty God, we are grateful for your presence in our lives. We are overwhelmed by your generosity and kindness towards us, by your gifts of grace, by the gift of your Son, Jesus, through your love and joy, through your peace, we are bound together by you. And so we thank you for giving us so many wonderful things in our lives, including oranges. God, we ask that you be with us and be with our church children this week, that they might remember kindness, to be kind to each other, to be kind to themselves. Help them grow up into the loving people of God that they already are, so that they can continue to serve you in your holy way. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Got to get a little bit of everything. That's really good. <laughs> I'm always surprised, but it's really good. Oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. It's your servant bound for glory. Oh, dear Lord, please hear my prayer. Oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Keep me safe within your arms. It's your servant bound for When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. 
turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. You know, this passage, uh, it, it falls right between where Jesus gives Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount and the scene where the disciples of John the Baptist come and start asking questions about whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is getting quite a reputation at this point, but he isn't, you know, he isn't doing what people expected him to do or even, I think, what people wanted him to do. He's making waves and hanging out with all the wrong people, and maybe even teaching all the wrong things. You know, it's funny, those of us who, who grew up knowing about Jesus are familiar with him doing things like this, hanging out with tax collectors and lepers and prostitutes, but back then it must have seemed really strange for Jesus to be hanging out with these people if he was the Messiah. And to help a Roman centurion, no matter how good of a man he might have seemed, would have been alarming to say the least, especially if you're one of John the Baptist's followers and you're expecting, you know, the Messiah to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. But Jesus goes, and even though he doesn't meet this Roman soldier face to face, Jesus is impressed with his faith. And then right after that, Jesus, he, he takes care of a widow. And so it would have been confounding to people like John the Baptist. It, it was probably confounding to everyone. It, flabbergasted would have been the word that my, my dad would use, right? That Jesus doesn't seem to make a distinction here but between the powerful and the powerless. He, he doesn't seem to care who's who's Jewish or, or Gentile. He doesn't even seem to care if people necessarily believe in him or, or not. And, and he doesn't really seem to care about the rules at all. But at the same time, he, he really seems to care about people and about their faith and about their well-being. But he doesn't even really seem to care about their faith that much. I mean, it's pretty clear that he cares about God and he cares about people. And to be honest, from what I can tell from studying this stuff for a while, you know, that, that seems to be about all Jesus cares about. He cares about God and he cares about people. Period. End of sentence. Jesus was impressed by the Roman's faith, the Roman. 
the overlord, the, the master, the oppressor. And sure, maybe this one Roman sounds like he may be a decent, maybe even a, a good person, but he's still a Roman. I mean, how good can he really be? He's a, he's a spoke in the wheel of oppression, part of this machine that will eventually execute Jesus, a servant of a system that is crushing people, especially the Jewish people. And yet Jesus is impressed with his faith. I, I can understand why John the Baptist is a little perplexed by this Jesus. This guy who, who John had described as an axe waiting to cut down the tree, who would baptize people with fire. And John the Baptist warns people that Jesus' winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But John says the chaff he's going to burn with unquenchable fire. And yet here's Jesus impressed with the faith of a Roman centurion. I mean, that would sound odd to say the least. That, that would be perplexing. My dad would be flabbergasted. I mean, it would kind of be like if, if someone today said they were impressed with the faith that a terrorist must have. I wonder if Jesus would be impressed with my faith. I mean, that's a pretty heavy question to ask, isn't it? Would Jesus be impressed with our faith? Do we really act faithfully? I mean, what does that even really mean, to act faithfully? In this case, you know, for the Roman, it, it seems like uh, it means to act with humility. I mean, he recognizes Jesus' authority, and he gives Jesus authority, and he trusts in Jesus. And yet this widow, who we know nothing about, and nothing about the content of her faith, you know, she gets the same treatment because Jesus was moved with compassion. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't even really matter if Jesus would be impressed with my faith or not. He probably wouldn't treat me much differently. You know, I think this is why people don't like reading the Bible, because it can be really confusing. And, and if you take it seriously and really try and figure out what it's trying to say, yeah, I don't know about you, but for me, it leaves me with more questions than when I start, and definitely more questions than answers most of the time. I, I get why people were confused and perplexed by Jesus, you know, because honestly, sometimes I'm confused and perplexed by Jesus. And so what sense then are we supposed to make out of these stories in Luke here? I mean, if we boil it down, the only real thing that the Roman and the widow have in common besides losing somebody they care about and that they need is, you know, really that they're both outsiders. One's an outsider because of the power he has, and the other one's an outsider because she's powerless. And yet Jesus goes to both of them. And he cares for both of them. To Jesus, it doesn't really seem to matter who they are, or whether they have an impressive faith, or if we can't tell anything about their faith at all. And I think about that in the context of, of today's world, where we live in a world where it, it just, it seems like, I don't know if there are a lot of outsiders or a lot of people feel like outsiders. But I think we've all had times where, where each one of us has felt for one reason or another like we're an outsider, like we don't belong. I would bet there's a time in every single person's life where they felt powerful, where they've also felt powerless. In times where we felt faithful, in times where we felt faithless. And I think we all know what it feels like to be an outsider. The labels and lines may be different now than they were in Jesus' time. We might not wear necessarily labels like Roman or widow, but we still draw distinctions among people. We try and divide and define people by whole bunches of things, by social class or nationality or, or race or political affiliation or even by religion or even by which version of any particular religion we follow. There are thousands of different ways we create this insider-outsider mentality. 
But here Jesus, you know, he's telling us that none of that really matters. I mean, here's Jesus showing us that it doesn't even matter if you're full to the brim with a faith that impresses him like the Romans or if your faith's been rocked by loss and sorrow like the widows. I mean, to Jesus, it really does seem like the only things that really matter are God and people, that nothing else really matters. And so I wonder then, as we live in this world that's pretty divisive, as we all seem to be suspicious of those that we've somehow determined as other, and we look upon other people as outsiders because we all do it. I, I, I wonder what it would take to be more like Jesus, to live as though the greatest concern in our lives were God and other people. You know, I wonder how different this world would be if even just Christians put these two concerns that Jesus has above anything and everything else. You know, I wonder what would happen if, if beyond everything that seeks to tear us apart and divide us, if, if we could look and see the common humanity of each and every person we meet and, and understand, really understand how precious they are to God and to Jesus and how precious they should be to us. I mean, I think the truth of this gospel story is that Jesus, he saw past labels like Roman centurion and past widow. And all he really saw were real people with real sufferings and a real need. And he ran to meet them where they were and ran to help them. That he, he encounters a personhood of, of each individual as they are and for who they are. You know, and I believe we're called to do the same thing. To take care of each person that we meet. And to take each person as they are and who they are. And care for them to the best of our ability. That like Jesus, our greatest concern should be for God and for other people. And realizing then that our care and concern for God is directly reflected by our care and concern for other people. Amen. Let's leave the past behind Walk with me There's something else we need to find Say you'll go, don't make me wait There's no need As we continue our worship this morning, we open up a space for the giving of our offering. You can take this time to prepare that check that you meant to send in, or you can visit our website at wpcmunster.org slash online giving. We know that it is a difficult time for a lot of us, so if you are unable to give at this time, please don't feel any pressure. We really mean that. But if you find yourself able to give, 
During this time of our service, as we continue to worship God, I ask you to pray on what you can give to your home church. I will arise and adore to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand joys. Teach me some melody and it, sung by flaming tongues of wind. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, haunt of thy redeeming love. Teach me some melody and Now we've come to the time of our worship for the prayers of the people. If you have a prayer request that you would like for us to pray for on Sunday, please reach out and let us know who you would like us to pray for as a community. So let us now turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. God, we know that you are here for us. In this world of overwhelming pressure and uncertainty, we know that you are there, that our faith guides us to you. We ask that you be with us every day of our lives, and especially that you be with our loved ones, that you be with our friends and our family, that we pray for our loved ones, that you might be close to them, that you might bring a healing and soothing hand to them. We pray for those who have broken their bones. We pray for those who are recovering from cancer. And we pray for our loved ones who are battling COVID-19 right now. God, there is a lot for us to pray for in need and to pray for calling on your aid and requesting your help. But we also pray with thanksgiving and with celebration as we celebrate with Doug and Ann Williams for the arrival of their new grand baby. It is a joyous reminder to see the children of our church have children of their own and to watch the young family of Christ come together and to grow in your name and in your way. God, we ask that you be with the children of our church and the children of our community as they grow up in very strange and very difficult times. God, it is not just the family that we see and the church family that we love and our community that we pray for. We pray for the people of our nation who are also embroiled in their own battles with COVID-19, whose children are embroiled in their own battles with safety and going to school, with dealing with online learning. God, our families of our nation need you now more than ever. And so we ask that you be 
with the people of our country that you might bring a soothing and healing presence into their lives. God, it is not just our nation and our community and our families that we pray for. We also pray for the world. Our world is full of so many different people of so many different places that they all have their own unique struggles and difficulties. And so we pray for the people across the globe, those who are protesting against an unfair governance, those who are attempting to recover from COVID-19 or keep it under control. We all have our own struggles and our own faith, and so we call on you in our own homes together that we might pray not just for ourselves, not just for our community, not just for our nation, but for everyone who is in need on this day. God, we pray to you not just alone in our homes, but together in one voice praying the way that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, upon earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus walked this lonesome valley Hey, I know I normally do this in my robe, but uh, I'm actually kind of reshooting this last minute because uh, I did. I got an update on Chris Gloff, and I wanted to share that with you all before uh, we do the benediction. Uh, it seems like he he's turned a corner. He's uh, starting to heal. Uh, he uh, he even said that he's hoping that uh, his prayer is that he'll be able to come home this week uh, from Community Hospital. So uh, let's continue to pray for Chris. Uh, he's doing well. It sounds like he, he's turning the corner and well on the road to recovery. Uh, and knowing Chris, he, he's not sitting still there. So uh, let's give thanks to God for that and now receive this benediction. As you go into the week ahead with whatever joys and challenges it holds, don't be discouraged or disheartened, but remember the future that awaits for you as a child of God if you work for it. Hold on to that truth, live in that hope, and may the peace of God, the blessing of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you this day and in all our tomorrows. Amen. serve throughout this coming week. He it is who binds us together, and he it is who 
sends us apart to be God's people, be God's people.